My great-great-grandfather, John Kelly, who was a slave owner, came from Ireland. A city in Ireland, there was a potato famine. He decided to stop fighting his own family members. He went down to the Caribbean, and a place at that time was called Hispaniola. Hispaniola was one country, but today half of it is Dominican Republic, the other half is Haiti. He settled there in Hispaniola, the Haitian side, and he got a plantation and he bought some slaves. Slavery was real big at that time. And one of those slaves was named Pinky. Pinky was my great, great, great grandmother, which, believe it or not, was, from, I guess, from his siring or, you know, came from him. His family became sick. His crops started to fail because there was a curse placed on him by some of the, the Haitian slaves. Then he decided to go into, into Texas. He moved into Texas took some of the slaves with him. And when he got to Dallas, Texas, he had about four or five slaves left, Cupid, Senior, Pinky, and a few other slaves. And from there, that's where my father was born in 1917. My father married my mother in 1946 or so and moved to the New York area, and that's where I was born. My father didn't want any more children. At that time, it was about six or seven other brothers and sisters were born before me. He told my mother he didn't want any more. So my mother said, well, I'm pregnant now. I'm not going to get rid of, of my child. He said, yes, you are. He said, I already got it set up to take you to a back alley abortion clinic not far from a famous university there on the East Coast. And when my mother resisted having this abortion, he commenced to beating her and kicking her in the stomach and hitting her, trying to force the baby to come out or be stillborn. And so when that didn't work, he dragged her through the house and threw her in the car and took her down to where the abortionist was and they were already waiting for her. They put her on the table, put her feet up in the stirrups, went inside of her with all kinds of weapons of destruction. And then they also was using types of pills and different things like that, making my mother swallow them to try to destroy me from inside the, her, her, her stomach and to her, uh, her womb area. And they worked on her for two or three hours, my mother said. And my mother, she actually felt like there was some hands inside of her blocking me from being destroyed. And when my father and the abortionist saw that they could not reach me, and they could not pull out any parts of my body, was trying to pull me out piece by piece. And they seemed that they couldn't find me. They, they decided, they said, well, they, there's no way that she can either not be pregnant, or if she is, we guess gonna leave the baby because it's too much trouble. We'll kill her in the process. And my father didn't want to kill her. He was just trying to get rid of another baby. And God saw to it that he, he spared my life. And from that, I'm here today. I was four years old when I started using drugs. Uh, my brothers were shooting heroin. Uh, when I asked them, I said, well, let me have some of that. And they said, oh, no, you can't have that. You, you're nothing but a child. You ain't old enough yet. And I heard a voice. It says, you don't have to listen to them. Don't worry about it. I'll show you how to get high. He said, go in the kitchen and pull the chair up to the stove and turn it on and take what I tell you in there. And I'll show you how to huff. You know, and that's the first time I ever got into to huffing was at four years old. And he showed me what things to use. And like a, like a professional, I was doing that, getting high every day at four years old. And, and it just got, went from there. I was four years old and I got into other stuff and start uh, uh, smoking weed and different things like that by the time I was six years old. And when I got to be 10 years old, my brother said, okay, now you're old enough. You can have some of this cocaine. And they showed me how to deal with the powdered cocaine and how to use it. And, and it just went on from there. As Curtis grew older, he also realized his family was involved in voodoo, a type of witchcraft from Haiti. He also met a voodoo priestess who casted spells for love, money, and power, but for a price. The Haitian voodoo priestess, actually, she was a priestess in ha in, uh, from Haiti who lived in Brooklyn. See, everybody has a territory in, in, in witchcraft. 
It's just like drug dealers got a territory. Well, witches and voodoo people, they don't overlap a lot of times. They have their, their they say there's enough customers, customers for everybody to go around. So she, she uh, worked under, under my dad. She would act like she was a church evangelist. She would call meetings at our house and she would have women that come who have lost their husband. Not so much lost him because of death, lost him because he left her. And she would tell them, she'd say, um, you want to get your husband back? I got a potion for you, I use you for you, I have a fetish for this and that and the other. For every problem she had, she had a solution for you. And she was teaching me how to do the very same thing. She said, you are the seventh child. You are the seventh child of the voodoo priest and you're chosen. And she told me, she said, you weren't supposed to be aborted a sacrifice. You were supposed to be taught. And, and, and I didn't understand any of those things what she was talking about, but I found out later what she meant. She meant that my father was trying to abort me, but actually he was supposed to save me for me to go down to be uh, trained. And that's what she said, I'm here to train you so you can go down to Port-au-Prince and, and do uh, uh, work under Papa Doc Duvalier and, and in the palace there in Haiti. And uh, that's what she came to do. She came to, to train me. She was my teacher. Curtis continued to learn about voodoo, but even at an early age, he began to realize that all of his power came at a terrible price. At an early age, living in Connecticut, Curtis Kelly became involved in drugs and gangs. He was also instructed in voodoo, a type of witchcraft from Haiti, from a high-ranking priestess. But despite his newfound power and money, Curtis began to see voodoo's dark side. Uh, she taught me what the love potions were, how to use them, how to uh, 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 slow a person's business down. As far as uh, she, if you wanted to, to work a person over real bad with uh, Pavo Nocturnus, Pavo Nocturnus is a really bad thing. Night terror, she, uh, she showed me what, um, how to put a person in Nemos, Nemos. Nemos is to put a person in a, in a, a vicious spiral that they can never get out of. And the more they pay you to cast a spell off of them, the more they get wrapped into the spell. It's called Nemo Cycle. And she said, you, you, you keep a person in Nemo Cycle, you'll never be broke because they gotta keep coming back to you to get another spell and another spell, get them off of that spell, another spell off of that spell. And she was really, really a, a wicked person. And, and she, she was into control, manipulation, and keeping the person bound and attached to her. And that's what she was teaching me. She taught me all oh, so many things, but those were the, one of the main two things that she was teaching me. And she, she took advantage of them not having a whole lot of money and trying to, to, to get over real fast. And many of them, they were into the occult. They were not witches, but they, they believed that the, if God took too long, the occult would get it right now. They wanted that, that quick fix. And she was there to receive them. She's like a catcher's mitt, you know, there to catch you, you know. And at twenty dollars, twenty dollars back then was a lot of money, you know. Twenty dollars, not like it is now. That's just a tip now. But twenty dollars back then was a lot of money, and she would charge like twenty dollars to say you had a, a, a like I said, a, a, a condition, physical condition. And what they would do with your physical condition, they didn't have the power to heal you. If you had a cramp right here, they would remove the cramp from here and they would put it down here in your knee. They would shift it. You know, shift, it's called, witchcraft called shifting, where you don't, you can't heal, you don't have that power, but you shift. And they teach you how to, she teach me how to shift things from here to there, I move it over here. And what you do, you get a whole lot of people together in one room, all miserable, all suffering, you charge them $20, and you don't give them all of it, you give them a piece of the information to, meet, to keep them coming back. And as a child, I, I stood there and I watched and I said, this lady sure can't control people. She has a, a very crafty way of controlling people. And many of the people that she was controlling, they went to church on a regular basis. She was, and she would say, oh, isn't God good? Oh, don't we praise God today? And I would stand off in the corner watching it. Oh, isn't God good? But see, I can run up and down the stairs and see and, and bring her her supply of witchcraft stuff. You know, bring me this, bring me that, and bring me my pouch of this, or bring me my this, bring me my oil, bring me this. And I would bring this to her, and the people would give her the money, 
and, and she would give them this pouch, and they would go home, and I would watch husband after husband, boyfriend after boyfriend come back, because it is usual she would use it. One day, the voodoo priestess showed young Curtis a doll, which had some paranormal powers. Remember back in those days where you pulled a string and the doll would uh, talk? Uh, well, she didn't have to pull a string for her doll to talk. The doll would just talk to her, and she would talk back to the doll. And I was standing there in amazement. I said, how can a doll have a communic? How can you communicate with it with an object that that's not even human? But what it was, through this doll, the entity was housed and it could talk. Okay, it's a spirit that goes inside, inside of an, an, an inanimate object and could actually communicate. It can spin his head around, it can flap his eyes, it can move his mouth. And, but when you go to approach it, it just sits there. It'll just sit there and not move. But when she talked to it, it communicated, it told her uh, what person is coming tonight and what problem they had because it's a familiar spirit. That spirit can leave that doll, run to a person's house in the neighborhood and show them each one of their problems. Or well, show her each one of the people's problems. Case in point, one time in particular, she was doing another meeting at her house and the doll told her certain things. So at the meeting, I was there with her, and she says, uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm glad you're all here today. She said, uh, you right there, lady, right there. She said, you have a dresser drawer in your house. And inside of that dresser drawer, you have this, that, and she itemized everything that was in her dresser drawer and never been to her house. Now, most people go to church and say, oh, that's the spirit of prophecy, hallelujah. She saw hallelujah and going on. And I was there like a child like this. Okay. Lady, if you only knew this is witchcraft, this is sorcery, that's a voodoo priestess there. And then, and you know what? It wasn't free. They was, oh, the offering would grow then. Every time she would prophesy, I call it prophesy, prophesy inside of somebody out of God, the people would just throw money at her, just throw money at her. As Curtis plunged deeper into voodoo, he became frightened by strange apparitions that happened in his own bedroom. The, the voodoo priestess came into my room and set up all her, her fetishes and paraphernalia in my room. And when she, do, when she did that, then those things start coming through the floor. They started to, to, I mean, I would have things run through my room and I would see them running through my room about this big, chasing and running. And one particular time I was, I was asleep and all of her stuff was on my, on my, my desk, stuff. This, this stuff, these powders and all kinds of things and, and parts of animals and hair and fingernails and, and all those things. That's why you got to be very careful who you give your hair and fingernails to. <laughs> Seriously. They say, I want to collect your fingernails. Why do you want to collect my fingernails? Oh, I got to do something. That's okay. That's okay. Oh, I want to get a lock of your hair. Why do you want a lock of my hair for? You know, oh, I just, you know, I just want to, why you want to lock up my hair? No, I just want to, you know, so be very careful who you, you know, you just, just keep your eyes open on some of those things, you know. And so she had uh, my dresser drawer all filled with all kinds of stuff. And one day I was laying down and I heard something shaking under my bed. I said, what in the world is that shaking under here? So I woke up all the way. And I turned the lights on. I said, what can this be shaking under my bed? What is this? So I looked under the bed, and then I saw, I saw my, my dad. I said, Dad, what you doing under this bed? What's going on? You know, to myself, I said, you're sort of old to be playing these kind of games. You know, it's late. Go downstairs and go to sleep. He didn't say anything. Just got a grin on his face like this. And his skin tone was green, and he was all scaly. And I had never seen anything like this before. I said, Dad, what kind of stuff is this? And then he came out from under the bed, and the more he came up, he had the, the top torso part of him, but the bottom of him was like a fish's body, green scales like a fish. 
And he came up and he smiled at me and he laughed at me. And then he did one of these numbers and dived and went right through the floor. And at that time, I freaked out. I said, oh my God, this lady is really, she's turned this room into a horrible place. And I got up and I was so scared. I said, oh my God, what is this? Wow, wow, what is this? this wow, I didn't know this was all involved with this, with this voodoo stuff. And as I was sitting here on the edge of the bed with the light on, I heard something in the closet. And I said, oh now, what is this in the closet? I opened the closet door and there's about two or three little imps running, just running. And they ran right through the wall. And I said, oh my God, and all that night I get set up on the bed and I, and I was too afraid to go back to sleep. I didn't know what to do. And I said, my God, I said, wow, what am I into? And then that next day or so, she came, she came back. She didn't stay with us all the time. She would go to New York and come back, go to New York and come back, which was only like half an hour drive where we lived. And she said, this is where she told me. She said, uh, you know, you're a chosen vessel, that you are Haitian. I didn't know anything about Haiti at that time, only six or seven years old. She said, you're a chosen vessel and you're going down to the palace for Papa Doc. So I didn't know Papa Doc from, from hippity hop. I didn't know what it was. Curtis Kelly learned voodoo from an early age. But as he gained money and power, an evil demon asked him to pay the ultimate price. Well, I know there's one, it's called, it's called Big Face. This is, this is a very serious thing because it, it makes you, this spirit, this ghost, this ghost spirit thing, or called Big Face, it'll make you an offer. Its job is to make you an offer to sell your soul outright to the devil, sell your soul outright. So you could be around the perimeter, messing around with certain things, and witchcraft and voodoo and obey uh, Santeria and stuff like that. You'd be on the perimeter, but they want you in wholeheartedly, all the way in. They don't want you just playing around. They want you all the way in, and they'll send certain spirits out there to do it. And this was one of those spirits. And it, they said, come into the closet. And I went in the closet like they told me. They said, shut the door. Now I had to move some of the clothes around the closet, hanging up on the hangers and shoes in the way, of course, like closets are. And it says, join us, join us, bring your whole self into this. And I said, I thought I was already in it. Didn't you just see what I saw the other day, climbing up and jumping, <laughs> stuff running through the closet? I thought I was already in it all the way. He said, join us. He said, give us your whole self. I said, how in the world can I give you my whole self? I'm just a child. I don't know anything about giving my whole self. Say these words, and then you can join us full fledged all the way. And then when he said that, all the clothes disappeared. The clothes in the closet disappeared. The, the, the shirts disappeared. The shoes, everything disappeared. And this closet became like I was standing out in space with the stars. There was no floor. I was standing right there, the floor disappeared, and I'm standing there, and it was just myself and that spirit face to face. He said, if you give yourself total, like he would give you power. You'll have money. You'll have all the girls in the neighborhood plus. You'll have so much power that the politicians will respect you. The government will respect you and you'll be able to go through walls. You'll be able to go into the bank and grab all the money you want and come right back to the wall. All you have to do is, is say yes, give yourself to us totally. That God, that thing you heard of God, he's no good, he can't help you anyway. If he could have, he would have stopped us a long time ago. So that's showing you, you give yourself to us and we'll take care of you. And I stood there face to face with that thing and it seemed like I heard another voice, a teeny tiny little voice, about the size of an ant, almost. It said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't say yes. Don't do it. And I said, I didn't know who that voice was. I had never heard it before. But it said, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. And that, and that big face thing, that big spear with that big, ugly face, it was trying to show me, it showed me a vision of 
money and power and, 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 and all of these different things. And, but that little voice said, don't do it. Don't do it. And I said, no, uh-uh. Uh, and I started doing like this. No, 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 thank you. I, I, I'm going to stay right like I am. I'm not coming here long into this like you're talking about. And they said, he started screaming, why, 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 why? Come do it. We'll give you everything you want. And I said, no. When I said no, the floor came back. The clothes in the closet came back. I opened that closet door. And I said, Whew. My God, what is going on here? And I never listened to that thing again. Because what it does, if you say yes, you sign that 10-year contract, or you sign a 20-year contract in agreement with them, it'd be like most people that you see that get involved with it. The 10th year, they come get you. The 20th year, they come get you. They kill you right on that 20th year. And it happens. I can name some people that I know of that did what that thing invited me to do. They got the riches fast, they got famous on television, they became famous rock stars, they became famous actors and the actresses. And after that 10 year contract or that 20 years, they died right in that same month, day and week and second that they signed off. I was in some very, very evil stuff, but I was too deep into it at that point to get out. Curtis Kelly, as a young boy growing up in the New York area, became entangled in a web of voodoo. He was trained by a voodoo priestess and told he would be taken to meet the president of Haiti for additional training. But he realized the voodoo woman was robbing his neighbors by selling them false cures for their illnesses. He was tormented by demons at night who appeared to him in many forms. Finally, one particular demon offered him power, money, and women if he would be willing to give himself completely to these evil forces. He said no, but the battle was far from over. Okay, the waste of spirit. The waste of spirit is exactly what it is. It's a spirit that's job is, is to make you waste away a little bit at a time every day. Its job is to, to cause a lot of fear, a lot of fear the fear of being in a house by yourself, fear of turning the lights off, uh, fear of uh, uh, flying on an airplane, fear that uh, different things are going to happen to you, fear that you're going to that you're going to go broke. It torments you constantly. Like one famous actress said, the reason why she works so hard because she's afraid of going broke and she's tormented with that idea. So if you're tormented in public, you're tormented in private. It, it won't just attack you outside. It starts in your house. They love to hang out in closets and under beds. And their, 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 their main target a lot of times is children. They love to torment children. And I tell parents all the time, if your child say they see something in the room, don't beat them down. Just go in there and see. You know, let, let the waster spirit, this actual spirit, let them know that this child is not alone anymore. Now the child got some help. Go in there. If you're born again, spirit filled Christian, take your bottle, blessed oil, and anoint the threshold of that room. Just like Moses did the deaf angel. It's not the deaf angel, but it still torments. The deaf angel, you know, that came to, to, to do away with you. But this thing does to slowly pick at you until you are nothing but just a bag of, of torment. If the wind blows too hard, you'll say, well, What is that? What is that? That's the job of the waster spirit. It does what it says. It comes to waste it away. It's, it, it's in the bed, it's, 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 um, it's in the closet, and, it, and it's also known around the world as the boogeyman. That's his name, which comes from the Caribbean islands, the bogey. They used to call it the, the bogeyman. And children who were bad, they used, to, they used to be threatened by the parents to say, if you don't be good, you know. They would say, mom, if you don't be good, mom, I'm just going to taste the boogeyman after you, mom. You know, that's in the Caribbean. And, and children would be afraid, but by the time they got to, to America, it went from boggy to boogie. You know, and it's still, it is a spirit. And, and children are tormented by it. And then people uh, are called the waste of spirit in the church. Many church people have the waste of spirit to where they can't 
sleep at night. They're tormented. It takes your sleep away from you. It actually takes your sleep. You wake up in the middle of the night over and over again because you're under attack of the waster spirit. Say over in Europe, in uh, some parts of uh, Europe, they call it Tantu. It means to, it means household ruler. And when a person when a person dies, and and this is where this thing is so creepy. When a person dies, especially the male, the male of the, the man or the, the father, what this what the waster spirit would do, it would take on the appearance of that person, and it would walk through the house, and then you would feel. Uh, uh, your bed go down, you would feel you know, the, the room always cracking, pops, and like doors closing when nobody's in the house. That's the waste of spirit. And it, and it just looks like the face of a, a, of a, a ugly person. Sometimes gray in appearance, sometimes brownish appearance, big ugly cold eyes that never look to the left or right, but a stare straight ahead. Even though he knows you right here, if you see him, he'll just stare straight ahead by disregarding you being there, even there, he's there to torment you, but he's not paying you no attention because of him, you're not nothing. He's just coming to destroy you. You're in his house. He's gonna look right at you. I've seen him face to face. I've talked to these, actually talked to this spirit from time to time. It's very big hand. One finger is as big as both of my fingers put together on one hand. They're very big. I was even touched by him as a child. They was to, told me I was supposed to do certain things for him. It's an actual spirit. It slides in sometimes like it's got broken feet. You'll see it here sliding in the middle of the night. And you can feel it in the closet. You can feel radiation from it. That's why fear is nothing without the presence of it. That, that like radiation that comes off of the spirit, that's the part that torments you. That's the Bible said fear has torment. That's the part that torments you. If you don't feel it on your natural body, big deal. It hasn't done anything to you. You can laugh at it. But what it does, it knows that it radiates a type of radiation that burns, it makes you feel bad, you feel a, a horrible feeling, and then it'll have black spots in the ceiling, it'll be like clouds over cloud. That's when you know that that waste of spirit is in your house, and there's millions of people around the world who are tormented every day by a waste of spirit. They can see his actual look, like the face level of a man, because these are fallen spirits, they're fallen angels. You know, and they have an appearance like on the, like some of them have made a male actual appearance. It look like a man with the eyes, nose, and mouth. And the, and but God has not given us that spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And they love secrecy. They love it. They love for you never tell anybody that you're tormented. Don't say anything. Nobody's going to believe you. See, and that person that you want to tell, he may be tormented too. See, so there may be three of you tormented in the same room, but he said, don't tell, don't tell, because he doesn't want to be brought to the light. They hate the light. Any kind of light, they hate it. They hate it. They actually hate it. And that's why they, <laughs> they don't want you to turn on any lights up as far as knowledge of people knowing that they exist or the house light. They, they, don't, they, they don't want it. Curtis Kelly used voodoo to his advantage, but was also attacked by the same demons, which gave him money, and power. Kelly became aware of his own father's involvement in an occult club which practiced astral projection. My father's friends, they were very demonic. They come from a very demonic elite club. Everybody couldn't join or be involved with that club. You had some doctors, you had some lawyers and judges and, and, and people of, of high esteem in the community were involved with this with this occultic club. My father was one of the ring leaders of this. And I remember many times in the middle of the night, I would I would hear downstairs, we, we had up in the downstairs house, and I would hear a party going on downstairs. And I wanted to be involved with it. And and so I would get up and I would go downstairs, down the flight of stairs. And when they would hear me coming down the stairs, they would say, oh, here he comes, here he comes. And they would, I, I would see, I would see as their feet and everything went right through the wall, solid wall. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, how is that possible? And so they would come back again. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna sneak down there and, and see who these people are. And, and my father would be entertaining them. And, I was, and they would be partying, smoking, drinking, laughing, and making all kinds of noise. But when they would hear I'm getting close, Oh, here we come. 
And each time I come, I would see more, more of them. And, and they could actually just come right to a wall. They could ask for a project, come right to a wall. It was no problem to them. Now, be it in their physical body or spiritual form, I'm not quite sure, but I know they can do it. And there's many people out here that can still do that to the demonic realm. That's what those people were. They were, they were, they have sold themselves out 100% to where they can astral project and they can go from one place to another. That's why when you want to go overseas, make sure you know the principalities, powers, and everything in those regions where you go there, because in some parts of the world, there's those priests, and those, those shamans, and those voodoo priests, and the witches, and Santeria, and, and all the people that practice Obeya and all that stuff, those people are the higher level of witchcraft. They literally can, can get on their cedar broom and fly or levitate. They can do all of those things without it, without, without an airplane, without a helicopter or anything. They get straight guess. When they want to go somewhere, they just go. They just go in there. Whether in the body or not, I'm not quite sure how they do it, but that's the group my father was running with. I never actually seen my father do it, but I know when he was there, he disappeared too. One day, Kelly became aware of how powerful and deadly evil curses can be. My grandmother, um, I love my grandmother, and uh, one particular day I was walking through the projects and I heard an argument going on. I said, oh, who's this argument? You know me, I was always in for a good fight. I said, who's fighting? You know, not too much to see girls or ladies fight, you know, but they did fight in our neighborhood too. But and I recognized his voice from a distance, from a half a block away. I said, I started my grandmother. And she was giving somebody what for, too. She was giving it to him. Oh, boy. And so I got in closer to see what was going on, because they was always taught to stay out of grown people's business. You know, don't get into the business of adults. So we were taught that. So they said, if you see adults arguing, you stand back and you don't say anything. You know, so I did. I just stood back in the back a little bit as they were they were going forth and there was a man there he was saying something to my grandmother i had never seen this man before i didn't know who he was because i thought i knew everybody it's five thousand families in, in the projects and i knew everybody between new york and, and connecticut so i figured no i knew everybody i didn't know who this guy was arguing with my grandmother so i didn't say anything and i just stood back and, and watched and um he was going at it I mean, I mean, they were going there. My grandmother was little, but boy, she was holding her ground with this guy. And then she, she said something. She did her fingers a certain way, and she, and she said, I'm going to curse you. And she did one of these numbers, and she threw her hand, and she said some words that I won't, can never going to say those words. But she said those words, and, and that man fell over backwards. Bang, he fell over, hit the concrete real hard. And I looked at that, wow. I called her mama, I said, mama, I didn't know you had that kind of power, I want that too, you know? And so I said those words that she said. I stood there in the background, way over there, about 10, 15, 20 feet away. She didn't know I was there. And I said those same words she, she said, and I saw something start spinning, like a tornado start spinning, just like this. And it started spinning faster and faster, and I looked there, and it came like this, and right inside of me. I said, oh my God, what did I do? And then it was something was inside, and it was still kept spinning inside of me. And I got so scared, I ran in the house, wasn't that far from my house. I ran in the house, and I saw my brothers and sisters and everybody there, and I was trying to explain to them what was going on. And said something, I kept saying, something's in me, something in me. I, what's in you? I said, I don't know, something's in me. Get it out, get it out. Something's in me, get it out. I said, oh, you crazy, nothing in you. What's in you? I said, it's inside, inside, something's inside me. I said, all right, nothing inside of you. So that night, that night, one of my uncles, he had a drinking problem real bad. He and I was real close. My dad and I weren't close to my uncle. He sort of raised me. But everything my dad was showing me bad, he tried to show me good stuff. And so, but he had a drinking problem. And he was drunk, he laid on the floor. And, and I laid down there next to him, because he was my protector and my buddy. You know, he still is, he's still alive, so still love my uncle. And uh, I laid there, and next thing I know, I hear that spinning thing coming. Now it's coming again, middle of the night, it's coming again. And I said, Uncle, wake up, Uncle, something's happening, wake up. 
He was so drunk, he couldn't even lift his own head. He said, what's wrong, nephew? I said, something wrong, uncle, something wrong, something spinning inside of me. And the next thing I know, the closet door opened up and out stepped this big old green thing with wings. And he stepped on my arm. I tried to get under my uncle and I was trying to hide, but this big old green creature stepped on my arm and stopped me from moving. And I tried to scream and I was yelling and nobody was up in me, my uncle was drunk. That started a whole new thing from those words my grandmother was doing, putting the curse. When the Bible says, bless and curse not, because when you curse it, you be cursed at the same time. A lot of people don't know that. It's better not to curse and forgive than to try to repay cursing for cursing, because when you curse, it comes right back on you automatically, because what you've done, you open the door. When it came to curses, Kelly didn't hesitate to use them, even on his own friends. The Davis brothers went to a revival meeting and uh, uh, we were friends and I didn't like the idea that they went to church because after all I've been through, the church was an enemy. People in the church were weak and to me, I thought they were weak and cowards and wouldn't fight and, and, and that's how we were in the, in the street. So when I saw them, I felt like they were abandoning us, the rest of us, to go on chasing after this, this Jesus thing. And, and when I would see them come back and they would minister to a lot of our other friends because they were excited about being saved and they would tell the rest of the guys saying, you, you need to stop these drugs and stuff and come and get saved. Well, if they get saved, that leaves, I lose a lot of customers. I said, I'm gonna, send, I'm gonna send some curses after them, some spirits to curse them, to stop them, slow them down. And so these little spirits, I called them up. They came up out of the ground and I told them, I said, I'm sending you over here, and I want you to go over there and stop these guys. A warning, I'm giving them a warning. I want you to ter terrorize them, torment them, night and day, 24 hours a day, till they come back out here in the streets with us. So I sent this little one about so big. He went over there, and he came back, and he says, I can't do nothing to them, they're protected. And I stole that spirit, I said, what did I tell you to do? I told you to go destroy them. He went out again. And it came back and said, I told you, I can't touch them, they're protected. So I said, get out of here. I sent him you back down to the floor where you come from. So I another one, I sent a bigger I said a bigger one this time, a little bigger than about that size. And I said, now you go and do what that other one, he didn't do. I said, you go and destroy them. You go, you tear everything up, you tear their house up, you tear their mama up, you tear their cars up, set the house on fire with them in it. Do everything I tell you to do, you better not fail. So that spirit disappeared and it went. Then I waited, I waited for a few days, and that spirit came back with a sad look on his face. And I said, did you do what I told you to do? He said, I can't touch them. Just like that other one told you, we can't touch them. They're protected. And I got mad at him, I brushed him off. Then I astral projected out of my body. Left my body at one place, then I went into another place. And when I got there, I found exactly what it was, like a snap of a finger. And when I got there, there was, there was two eight-foot-tall angels with a flaming sword. They, they, they looked like they had been working out in the gym. They was tough. And, they, and, I, and I stood around the back of a telephone pole and I peeked out at them. I said, man, I see why them little imps couldn't do nothing. Wow. Then I went back. I went back into myself. And, and man, these guys, they're wild. They got some serious power, man. My God, they got some power behind them. Kelly decided he now wanted some of that same protection from the angels he had seen on the occultic dark side. Because of his involvement in voodoo, Curtis Kelly was tormented by demons throughout his whole life, but he left his occult lifestyle. But he leaves us with a sober warning of the consequences of dabbling in the occult. Let me show you what, what form. If a person gets into, say, seances, a Ouija board, stuff like that, or pentagrams on the floor, and candles, and all those little kinds of things, or blood sacrifice, sacrificing a cat or animal, you have opened yourself up for possession, or a poltergeist, and all of his cousins are going to come in there, and they are going to give that house a fit. It will be horrible, okay? 
Then there's other ways. Television can be another way as a portal they can come in. If a person watches pornography all the time, watches pornography, that spirit, okay, that point A spirit, like in the Greek and the French, will come in. It will literally march through that porthole and it will set up and it will sit and it will wait and it will sit and it will wait and it brings sickness. It will bring all kinds of diseases. It will bring all kinds of stuff in there just because that television was a vehicle to be used to come in. And that's just one way. Then, then there's, there's uh, uh, all kinds of, of, of um, say, uh, uh, anger. Anger. If a person, if a, say if a man is in the house, always angry. No matter what the wife does, that man going to be angry, angry, angry. It's like she pull her hair off the roots and he's still angry. She can do cartwheels. She can cook a feast. She can do every second he's angry. What's happening? There's five different types of anger. And all of those types will start to come in to, it, to his house. And in his house would be a house of, of rage. And that is an actual spirit. It's an actual spirit called Nectiel. Nectiel comes in and it's a power. It comes in and it has power. It takes complete power over that house. And the children will, will start to act bad in school. Uh, 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 there's no love there. Uh, people will come and they can feel that. So, you know what, man, it's getting late. I'm going home. Wow, this is a bad house to be in. It's, it's, I feel the creeps when I come in here. It's because of that person has allowed those things to come in. After experiencing the occult firsthand, Kelly feels he will never go back to his former practices. So you got to draw a line in the sand. You can't follow me no more.